Holy guacamole. Oh, no, don't say that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Holy guacamole. We're going to sing that. I, had my I think dad, that's the Mexican I, I version. I had my dad chase me around the dining room table and then out around a couple blocks. I had to stop because I was going to give him a heart attack because he would never catch me. <laughs> I, I was a, a cross-country track star. So it was dinner time. We had a priest sitting at the table with us. And um, he said, okay, why don't you say grace? So I said, rub a dub dub thanks for the grub. And I looked over, and I saw the smoke coming out of his ears. And quickly, I just kind of, I, I shot away from the table, and he followed me pretty quickly out, out of the house, around the block. We were going around my neighbor's oh my car. Lord. <laughs> that was crazy. If he got a hold of you. <laughs> I chased, he chased me a whole block, and then around the car about four times. Oh, and I man. was like, if he had ever caught me, I would have been dead. Yes. yes. <laughs> Rub a dub dub. Ask him to pray. So he asked Sean to pray. He asked me to pray, and I said, rub it up, dub, thanks for the grub. <laughs> Instead of, he blesses, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from my bounty through Christ our Lord. You know, you grew up with it just like me. That was the proper thing to do, and I was being a, a jerk. And my father chased me. Well, I uh, ain't seeing the priest half lit. I'm sure that didn't but discourage you. I didn't think anything of it. That was just, I mean, he was at our table once a month, and that was how he generally was. He was actually a, a nice guy, funny guy. Just, he might have found it humorous. <laughs> he probably did. The whole thing. <laughs> it was a story to tell. Yep, yep. Page 70. Page 70. Holy, holy, holy. Early in the morning, I smell rise. We'll do one, two, and three. Ready for an intro, sir? Yeah, let's do it.
pray that we would uh, draw, draw closer today to understanding me and, and holiness, Lord. And thank you uh, even now for what you've prepared for us through the preaching, Lord, and the teaching. The teaching. We pray that you'd bless it, help us to receive it, and grow therein, Lord, and uh, to be more of what you'd have of us. We thank you for it. In your precious name. Terry, I didn't tell you, we'll pray for Rose's brother. She had asked me this morning. So her, his name is Alden, or Albin. He's from Germany. I guess he's going back. He's visiting. Oh, that's what it is. And Rosie's not coming. She wasn't feeling too well, and she, so she's staying home. But just pray for my brother. So, Lord, we pray for Albin before I forget. I know Rose has uh, spoken to him and obviously given him the gospel. And I pray that you'd open his heart and his eyes and whatever's resisting, uh, you know, he's whatever's in him that's resisting the truth, uh, yield it, break it, and let him see it. So you do the work only you can do. I know Rose, is, Rose did her part, and she asked us to pray. So I'm praying for Albin that he'd save his soul and let him trust in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Rosie. I didn't forget. All right. All right. Open your Bibles. So open them somewhere. I don't know. Open them. It's all good. It's all good. It's open them. Open them. That's the, that's the famous line. Open your Bibles. It's open anywhere. It's all good. It's all good. All right. I'm going to do a Sunday school teaching for the couple, next couple of weeks on what God, what is God? What about God? Or I should say God is what? God is what? Well, first one, God is holy. We just sang it. God is holy. Now, there's a lot to cover, so I'm not going to do it in one Sunday school. I'll do it over two. Because I had like six really good points that I could make on Sunday school on God is. And they're all in Scripture, and I could, you know, expound it. But I'll break it up over a couple of lessons. So today we're going to look at three. We're going to look at God is holy, God is merciful, and God is righteous. Now, these other things, too. God is love. I know that. That'll be next week. Yeah, I got, we got, I got this. God is holy, God is merciful, God is righteous. Next week we've got, we got this. God is love, God is jealous, and God's consuming fire. So it's all true. It's all in there. and you get, That's the thing in the Bible. You've you, you got to look at the, the totality of it when you're looking at a topic. That's where Christians sometimes go wrong. They get a couple of verses right on a specific topic, and then they draw their, yeah, they draw their, all their conclusions from those verses, and it's in the Bible. Yeah, but it also says this. God is complex. Yeah. All right? And you'll, you know, the Bible is complex. And you can get out of it what you need to get to live a good life, like the message today. Doing life. And we'll talk about that. But as far as understanding all the things about the Lord, I've been studying the Bible 34 years. I mean, yeah, I, I got a good understanding now, but there's so many things that still are... It's inexhaustible, and some of these you don't really fully understand. You can't, like you just prayed. You can't really. Hi. Hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. You're, you're known as Eva to some. David. Well, that's not on. There you go. Thank you. All right, so for bear, I have to repeat that again. God is holy. Uh, God is righteous. And God is merciful. So let's look at that right now. Psalm 99. Next week we'll cover three more. You got that. And Rose, you didn't hear, but we did pray for your brother, Rose. Alvin. And if she is, Lord bless you, Rosie. Feel better. I don't think she's watching now. She'll watch it later, she said. She was going to sleep. So God is holy. Psalm 99, look at verse 9. Okay, verse 9, Psalm 99, 9. 
Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is what? Holy. When Moses met the Lord in Exodus 3, and he met him and he said that, uh, what is your name? I should tell the people. He said, tell them I am that I am. So he tells that to God. He tells that to Moses. But before he does that, he says to Moses, take off the shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is what? Holy ground. Holy because God was there. It was holy. And he said, take off your shoes. You, you, you got it. You're in the holy presence of God. And that's what he does. So Moses in that type, it's like us. When we come before the Lord, we need to strip ourselves from things that have the world's dirt on it, like your shoes, and get it off. You come into the presence of the Lord. Come to church on a Sunday like you pray, Terry. You, you prepare your heart to get what the Lord put on my heart to put out so that you leave here better than when you came in. Amen. That's the purpose. Church isn't just a religious activity to do to check off the box Amen. like I did that. It's a place you want to be to learn, to grow, and to feel better and to feel clean. Uh, speaking about being clean, I talked about that Wednesday night. And I talk a little bit more now. God is holy. He says this in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, ye are the temple of God. Therefore, be ye holy. The followers should be holy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3.17. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So, God is holy. The place where he is in his presence was holy. And the temple of God is holy. Where's the temple of God today? It's not in Jerusalem. It's us. Oh, there, there will be one in Jerusalem fairly soon. And that's one of the greatest signals, church, uh, to the body of Christ at large. If they're paying attention, when that temple goes up, it won't be long before this temple gets out. Because it can't coexist too long. There'll be some, might be an overlap for a little while, but it can't be too long. So keep that in mind. And that temple is what's the next big event to happen that we'll probably witness is that building of the temple. Again, so um, he says in Corinthians, Paul says, you're the temple of God. The temple of God is holy. Paul, the Lord came into Jerusalem. I talked about that on Wednesday, I think it was. And he had that whip and the money, he knocked over the table, the money changers. He said, you make my father's house a den of thieves and a house of iniquity. It should be a house of prayer. He knocked them over and chased them out. Well, what's that symbolic in your life? In other words, the, you let the Lord in when you got saved. Amen. He doesn't want to coexist with dirt or sin. So he wants to cleanse the temple. Who's the temple? We are. We are. So that's a constant reminder to keep clean spiritually. Not just physically. That was the verse I used uh, Wednesday night. Uh, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7.1. That's the verse I used last week. Uh, so, and, and the other thing is that Peter repeats that same thought. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy, saith Lord. Now Peter's quoting something the Lord said back in the Old Testament. But the idea that Jesus is holy, be ye holy for I am holy. That's what the Lord said. Well, you know, truth be told, you're not holy. You are partly holy. And you should work on your holiness. The fact that God, you got God in you, you got his righteousness in you. No question about that. And you're probably a lot more holy than you were once before. So that, that I go for, I accept that. But I'm saying, understand that God is holy. And we as children, we should too be holy. And that's a constant reminder to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Holiness is a manner of conversation and behavior and attitude. That's what holiness is. It's not, you know, holiness, that's what, holiness isn't uh, your attire per se. Yes, there could be some issues with your attire. I understand that, but I don't have an issue with that. If somebody's in, in really improperly dresses, one thing. But as far as being, you know, everybody has liberty in those areas. Y you have to use common sense. All right? But holiness, you can't measure just by, you know, do you look like me today? No. That's not holiness. Holiness is an inward attitude. It's a manner of speech. It's your behavior. It's how you, it's not a, right. It's not a right. You have to conform to this rule. If not, you're not holy. 
when my wife was a young girl, she remembers seeing a nun. Now, she was raised Catholic, as was I, but she went to Catholic school. Uh, I didn't. But, um, and she remembers seeing uh, some nuns that, that uh, you saw them somewhere outside of, uh, they were dressed normal, and she flipped out. She was shocked, like, cause if for whatever reason, you're, you get this impression that they were different. And now she saw them in regular clothes, and she couldn't get her mind around that, like, wh what's going on here? I remember when our pastor years ago, Bob, when he was teaching at, um, teaching at a big Catholic church in Brooklyn, St. Thomas Aquinas, big one, and he was a lay teacher because he didn't he, to get out of the Vietnam War. He says, oh, I'll get a deferment, I'll go teach, and he did. He wasn't saved then, but when he was teaching, at some point came Christmas time, holiday, and yeah, there, there was lay teachers, and there was also brothers and, you know, nuns, and the mixed, mixed bag there. He was a lay teacher. So then at the Christmas party, he was going to go home where he goes, no, oh, stick around. And he's, come on, come on, we'll have a good time. And, you know, you know he, he, here he is. He's still getting deceived too, thinking that is a separation, right? And he goes down and, you know, they roll out the bars and here come, they're all, all, their, all their habits come off and, and, and they're dressed normal and they're dancing and they're drinking. And, and he's like, whoa, smoking up a storm and all this. He's like, whoa. Wh wh you know, he wasn't a holy roller, but he's like, I thought they were different. I know I'm messed up. That's what he felt. But that's what helped lead to his salvation. So keep that in mind. Holiness, you got, you got to be get convicted about how you look and how you appear. But your speech, your behavior, you with me, church? That's, that's your manner of life. The, the wife shall, lead, uh, shall win the husband by her conversation. 1 Peter 3.1. Yeah, it says without, that that may be one without the word. So the conversation you would normally think, cause depending on context, can be speech. It could also mean behavior. How could you win your husband by your conversation, but without the word, by your behavior? And that's the uh, that's what your holiness comes in. Here's a question you ask yourself before I move on: Where can I clean up? That that's all. Just where can you clean? I'm not saying yeah. I'm not getting on anybody. You're bunch of dirty dogs. No, I'm saying that you got some, we still got some areas to clean up. That's all. Just be honest. It's when you start, when you start thinking that you've arrived, which we'll talk about during preaching, that's when you got problems. So always, it's better to err on the side of caution than, than on pride. Turn to Psalm 116. Okay, God is merciful. God is holy, one, two. God is merciful. Are you glad God's merciful? Amen. If it wasn't for God's mercy, you might not be alive today. Mercy is you not getting what your actions and sins require. That's what mercy is. Grace is you getting something you don't deserve. It's just the opposite. It's the heads and, heads and tails of a coin. Grace and mercy, that's why they're always used together, although different. Grace, you're receiving something that you didn't deserve, right? Mercy, you're not receiving something you do deserve. Get that? It's a great way to remember in your mind the difference between grace and mercy. So mercy is God not exacting out of you what your sins require. When you trust Christ, when you trust Christ, when you did that, say amen. 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 Well, the moment you did that, that's you found God's mercy through Christ. Now God will have mercy on you because of what Christ did. And the fact is that that mercy, he took that payment, the penalty, the stain from you. And therefore God has mercy on you. He concluded them all in unbelief, Romans 11, that he might have mercy upon all. Jew and Gentile alike. There's no distinction. He'd have mercy upon all because they've all fallen short and they all do not meet up to God's standard so it's without his mercy we don't get in so the good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 turn there for a minute Luke 10 
Luke 10, let's look at verse, let's see, 30. Yeah, let's look at verse 30 to start this for a minute. Watch. Verse 30, and uh, Jesus answering <clears throat> said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. That's where we get that expression. He's half dead, right? Come on, the Bible has all the, all the expressions. Saved by the skin of his teeth, half dead. It, can't you read the writing on the wall? It's all in the Bible. All right, half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, a certain priest. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. All right. And likewise a Levite. Now, all priests are Levites, not all Levites are priests. Amen. All priests are Levites, not all Levites are priests. Levites could have been, you know, uh, uh, from Kohath, Merari, or uh, Gershon, Gershom. And they, they didn't know all the priests. Kohath had to be the priest line. But they were, all, they were Levites, and they, the other one was priests. They were religious elders. They were religious leaders. So Levite, verse 32, when he was in the place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. So the priest and the Levite passed by the guy who was just wounded and robbed and left half dead. Right? Okay, verse 30, 33. But a certain Samaritan. Uh-oh. Samaritan's a half-breed. Jew and Assyrian mix. They're not pure Jew. They're looked down upon. But a certain Samaritan, Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had what? Compassion on him. Hmm. And went to him and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Pretty good, right? And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And he said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. By the way, those two pence could be a reference to the 2,000 years of the church age, by the way. And when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now, of, which, which now of these three, here's the question. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And verse 37, and he said, he that showed what? But I got that, 37? And I said, he that showed what? Mercy. mercy. Oh, he that showed mercy on him. Then the Lord says, go and do thou likewise. Is that clear? Yeah. <coughs> we said, read in Psalm Psalm 116, let's go back there. Verse 5. And then we'll read this. And then uh, that's the story I wanted to give you. The Bible example was the Good Samaritan. He did something the Levite and the priest didn't do. So then the Lord said, which of these three did the right thing? He says, the one that showed mercy on him. Hey, very good. You go do the same thing. Go do the same thing. God had mercy on you, right? At some point in your life, and you have and you need to continue to demonstrate some mercy. And when you don't want to, think about the fact that God had mercy on you. This is, this is one of the elements. I mean, again, it's God's, God's a complex being. He's got all these attributes perfectly in perfect symmetry. We don't. But it's good to learn about them. So good Samaritan, we just read that, and here's Psalm 116, verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is what? Merciful. Did I say that? Psalm 116, verse 5. Our God is what? Turn, turn to Psalm 137. Um, 136. Actually, 136. It's the mercy chapter. I'm not going to read all that. I want you to look at it because i got to spare my throat for preaching and it's still not 100%. Let's look at verse 1. Go give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
O give thanks unto God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Just look at the end of each verse. For his mercy endureth forever. Verse 4. Somebody say it. For his mercy endureth forever. Come on, church. Ready? Verse 5. For the end of it. For. Well, look at it. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. Look at verse, verse 10. To him that smote Egypt in the firstborn. So for his what? Well, his mercy didn't endure to the Egyptians. It endured to the Jews because they obeyed him. Each one, his mercy endureth forever. Keep going. So that, that, that's the whole psalm dedicated to God's mercy. And you read through it, you learn something about God's mercy. But the idea that we know God's a merciful God. When the Lord went to Calvary and he paid the sin, from, took pay the penalty for our sin at Calvary, that's how you, where the Bible says mercy and truth are met together in Psalm 85. Mercy and truth are met together. Um, kiss the son lest he be angry at you. Uh, mercy and truth are met together. And, and that's met in Christ. Mercy and truth. And when we get, when we receive Christ, you get everything. The whole enchilada. You get mercy, justification, his love, and we get everything. So that's a great thing to do is accept Christ. But it took place at Calvary. And that was a demonstration of God's love and also of God's mercy. You know, we think about the mercy. Here's the Lord on the cross. He's, he's between two thieves, right? He's in the middle. The thieves both make fun of him. He's on the cross from nine to three, six hours. When was man, what day was man made? Number of man is six. He's on the out cross for six hours. Twelve to three was blackened out. Three is manifestation. And during that blacked out period, he was paying the price for our sin. But the thieves both mocked him until about 12 o'clock noon. That's when the other guy saw the earthquake and uh, the sky darkened and the eclipse took place. And he was like, you know what? We're getting what we deserve. This guy did nothing wrong. Lord, have mercy on me when you come into your kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know that, that was mercy on a someone who was dying hours away from death, who was going to go to hell for his sin. That I died for his sins. He was going to go to hell, and the Lord said, "No, today thou shalt." Why? Just by calling on him. That's God's mercy. I'm not giving you what you deserve. He he was going. He was he was already crucified. He was going to die. He took that from him right there. That was you and I, by the way. Next, uh, next to the cross, next to him. Mercy, God's mercy doesn't exact, here what I wrote, God's mercy doesn't exact from us what our sins demand, but overlooks them because of our acceptance of Jesus Christ. God ignores our sins claims and cancels it out by his blood. That's mercy. So when you do, you say, thank God for his mercy in your life. Have you thanked him? Say Amen. Thank him for his mercy. You should thank God for his mercy every day. It's God's mercy you're alive. It's God's mercy that you exist and something didn't happen to you worse than it could have. It's God's mercy. You know, sometimes when you look back at your life, we're going to talk about that during the preaching, but there's times you look back not to embellish your sin or to want to go back, but it's good to look back to see whence you've come from. That's a different. Uh, why to come out forth out of Egypt? You know, why'd you look, look back to realize what you got delivered from? Not to say, oh, uh, those are the good old days. I want to go back to that. No. You look, you didn't get killed in the good old days. Well, I would have went to hell. But I, but I believe, I knew, I believe in Jesus. I would have went to hell. What, 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 what do you say? Did you, did you believe? I believe in Jesus. If you asked me, did I believe in Jesus? I would have said yes. I wasn't. I, I would. I, well, I didn't believe in Muhammad. What did I believe in Buddha? Did you go? Did you believe? Je yeah, I believe Jesus. Yeah. What did it mean anything to me? It's like a, it's like you know, you, it's like a kid studying for a test, and they cram to get these answers right, and they have no idea what. All they know is they they took enough of these tests, they became test wise, and then they have the test. Oh, I think that's so, and they get they got the right answer. They didn't know what it was. It's not. It is. You get, you get like, here you are, you get an you know, immunization, you got the little Jesus, that's enough now. Yeah, don't learn, then you become dangerous. But, so, what I, if you would ask me, was I, did I believe in Jesus? Yes. Any Catholic's going to say that, right? 
But does that mean they're saved? No. If someone sneezes, God bless you. Oh, he must be a Christian. You know, I had a sixth grade teacher. I could, isn't it funny how you remember these things? Sixth grade for me is a long time ago, amen? So why? And I remember, she, I remember Ms. Torchinsky, man. She was a good teacher for, for what it was. I mean, she was a good, really good English teacher. I always followed my brother because he's a year older than me. Oh, you're John's brother? Yes, Mrs. T. She went by Mrs. T, you know. Torchinsky, kids with tongue twister. So she says, Miss, yes. Oh, well, that's terrific. Uh, you, know, you know, he was an A student. I said, I know. <laughs> Every teacher tells me that. I know that. John, help me out here. <laughs> Although I did well in English, it wasn't an issue. But the fact of the matter is, Miss Torchinsky would say this. It was a terrible thing to say as a kid. I got a Steve Sacco, if you remember, sir. Steve. I think Steve was in that. I think no, Steve wasn't in that class. Steve wasn't in that school yet. He didn't come till uh, junior high school. He wasn't in that elementary school. But someone sneezed, blow, and he'd say, "She'd say, hey, this is what she'd say: God bless you. May the devil take you." I'm telling you, I'm telling you this now. Fifty years later, God bless you. May the devil take you. And I was like, Mom. I'm a kid. Thought it was kind of you know, funny. <laughs> But I said, was that kind of weird? I remember telling my mom, mom said, that's crazy. Why'd you say that? I, said, I have no idea. She said, that was her thing. May God bless you and the devil take you. Miss Torchinsky, probably a good teacher, probably a wicked woman. Save her soul in Jesus' name if she's not dead already. But anyway, why would somebody say that? I could tell you, it's not right. I'll tell you that. Have you been merciful to others? Come on. You have been. You have been. Are you, I, listen, we're going to talk about that more during the preaching, but I'm, you've extended mercy, come on. Well, you remind yourself that, if you haven't. When some, you know, sometimes you need to just suck it up and be merciful. God helped me out the other night, man, you guys don't even know. God helped me out Wednesday night if the church was a blessing, I got a blessing. And it wasn't monetary, it was a blessing. It really was, because I got answered my prayer. It was beautiful. It was between him and me. Yeah. So thank you, Lord. So yeah. It was, it, was, it was mercy, you know. I showed a lot of mercy. All right, look at this. God is holy. By the way, God is holy. You can't get in God's presence because you're, you're not holy. That's why, that's why in Isaiah 6, when the Lord was there, holy, 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 it says. And Isaiah gets his vision. He sees the, he, he's in awe of what he, this vision he gets. Uh, when the Lord rep- appears to Job, he falls down because he realizes he's unclean. Or Peter, he's unclean. And the idea that those three people, as, as well as anyone else, get close to God, you realize your sinfulness. That's why we sang that song, Holy, Holy, Holy. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you come to an understanding of how holy God really is. It's like you see a light shine. We talked about that not long ago when you see all the dust then. And the way it's certain days. That it's, and it, you just cleaned it, but it looks like there's still dust there. The light exposes the what? Dirt. Yes, and the closer you get to the light, the, yeah, that's right. He sees right through us. So that's why we need Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. And, to, and also to try to be, live a good life and be holy, try to do right. All right, holy. He's, 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 uh, he's merciful. Thank God he's merciful. Turn to Romans 10. He's righteous. He's all that. There's more too. He's got more. I've got plenty more. Took a Romans 10. This is a great verse. To look at Romans 10 verses 1 to 4 for a Jewish person especially that's tended to the truth and kind of understands there's something wrong with their system if they get to that point it's a great verse to show them look at Paul says in verse 1 Romans 10 1 brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what Saved. That's, that's his burden. 
Uh, by the way, did God call Paul to Israel? No. no. But was that his burden? Yeah. Yes. You can have a burden for something. It doesn't mean you're called to do that. Sometimes burden gets, burdens get translated into ministries. Sometimes they just remain a burden. It depends what God, how God's going to use you. In this case, God said <clears throat> to Paul, yeah, I know you're burdened for the Jew, but you're going to the Gentiles. And Paul's like, yeah, but I was a, I was a Pharisee, man. I, was, I, I know all that. I could help them. God's like, really? Yeah, I know that. No, you go talk to the Gentiles now. Who you send to the Jews? I'll send Peter. Peter? Peter? Really? The fishermen? The, the cusses? That, that guy's going to talk to those erudite Jews? No, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, just watch. <laughs> you never know. You know, it does. Hudson Taylor goes to China, 1900s, you know. Learn to speak Chinese. You know, you know what Hudson Taylor does? He dresses like the Chinese. He's the first one that, ch that broke the mold. And his mission board wanted to drop him. Because he didn't have Western attire. <coughs> but he said, I'm trying to reach them. They don't dress like that. That was wisdom, right? Sir. Mike Flick was in Africa. He's been still in Africa. He's South Africa now. And, but Malawi was different, you know. That was in South Africa. That's Dutch, basically. And Afrikaners and... But up there in Malawi, that was, you know, he was in a rough area. And just, he learned the language. He learned Chichawi. <laughs> what? Excuse me? God, what? My, he's, I don't know, God, he's his brother Joe. God just kind of gave him tongues, man. He, gave him, he, he studied, but it just came to him. And he wasn't like a linguistics dude, like my uncle, but he learned it. Mike's smart. And he tended to heart for God. Got hands on all over the guy. So... But he said the culture in Malawi was different. Really? Really? The culture was different. They would jump around and dance and shout and sing and go cry. And what are you going to do? That's what they, I got no problem with that, but that's some people. Oh, man. He didn't care. Then he goes to South Africa, now it's different. You go to a, go to a exciting uh, camp meeting. I've been to many people jumping around and shouting and hollering. Then go to a Presbyterian church and preach, and they'll sit there like Go to Catholic church and the lights are dim and candles flickering and no one says a word and they're kind of sleepy. And then when the mass is over, they all wake up. <laughs> the mass ended. Go in peace. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. Look at verse 2. For I bear them record, Romans 10.2, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Oh. Here it is. For they being ignorant, talk about Israel, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Here it is, verse 4, mark it down. For Christ is the end of the law of right, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Amen. You get God's righteousness through Christ. Is that clear? Look at verse 4 again. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. You can't, in other words, you can't keep the law perfectly to get God's righteousness. Who did? Christ. Christ, not Moses. So when Christ kept it perfectly, you, get ex you accept Christ, you get God's righteousness. Christ, listen, Christ is God's righteousness. Amen. How do you get it? By accepting Christ. For God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. In who? In Christ. Right. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And it says right here, verse 4, he's the end of the law of righteousness to them that believe. The Lord, it says in Daniel 9.14, the Lord our God is righteous. The Lord our God is righteous. I just quoted to you 2 Corinthians 5.21. Here the ascension. You know, when the Lord wrote, we talked about that a few weeks ago, before uh, Resurrection Sunday, and then I did the teaching and the chart. When the Lord went up, do you know that that's called, that's, the, uh, that's called a righteous act? The most truly righteous act committed was the resurrection? Because he was sinless. Couldn't be held. And that was pure righteousness that went back up. That's what he says in John. Talks about, you know, of sin. Because they don't believe of righteousness because of the resurrection. So what are you talking about? Christ went up by, he was righteous. He was perfectly holy and pure. That was a righteous act. What, you know, 
think about righteousness for a minute. When you, when you get saved, again, Christ, the righteousness, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, goes inside of you. So where's Christ's righteousness? It's in you. Right? That's what 2 Corinthians says. And you believe that. I believe that. Well, the Bible says that. But the Ephesians 6, what it says about the, the armor of God, some Christians get that mixed up. They think that that righteous, that breastplate of righteousness is God's righteousness. What, what are you talking about? How you, you know, it's not a breastplate. The, God's righteousness is inside you. What that is, is your desire to live righteously. You put the breast, you put it on. Put on the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. Gird your loins of truth, charge your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, the ward of the fiery darts of the wicked, all the, right? Those things you put on. So that righteousness is the God, the breastplate of righteousness, gird your heart, watch, with righteousness. If you're already saved, you got it in you. So now you have a choice. Watch, will you put the armor of God on or not? You're saved either way. Are you going to go out to battle with unprepared or with the armor on? I think you should go out with the armor on. And walk in, in, walk in that righteousness and do right. That's all it is, do right. You, you, got, you already got it in you. you. It's in you. The moment you got saved, you got that put in you. Work out your own salvation. Or how about the fruit of the Spirit? It's already in you. The fruit of the Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit in you. Well, then why don't those fruits always manifest? Well, you need to obey. And, and so they come out. Just like you need to choose to do righteousness. Some Christians choose not to do right. And, that, and, and, and then if you do right, don't worry about them. Just do what you got to do. Amen? God is holy, mer merciful, and righteous. Uh, and uh, and right, he is righteous. He's a righteous God. Uh, I'm made righteous by Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not righteous. You might be righteous compared to the next guy. You know, compared to two lost people together. Yeah, yeah. And one's better than the other. Well, that's what we do. We compare ourselves. And Paul said it's not wise. But we do that to feel a sense of worth and self-justification or self-acceptance that I'm better than him or her. Well, yeah, on uh, some levels that might be true. But when you compare yourself to God, you've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. How do you, how do you think you're righteous then? Because of Christ. I got Christ's righteousness. Amen? And as a result of that, I should try to live a righteous life. Father, be with us, Lord, and prepare our hearts for the message to come. Uh, get everybody else in safely, and thank you, Lord, for the, your mercy and kindness, and your righteousness, and you imputed to us, and salvation you've freely given us, Lord, and help us to get a hold of these thoughts and meditate. You're holy, you're merciful, you're righteous. We'll cover some more next week. Prepare our hearts for the preaching, and get everybody else in safe, and thank you for your love and your kindness toward us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.